Thank you. I have the family fun. All right. Oh, one second. I have one other thing. I really didn't see yesterday. Where's my little? See? Seriously, where's my person? No, I want captains. Must not. The second from the bottom. What was the second from the bottom? Yep. Was caption Thank you. Hey. Yeah. There? Yeah. Oh my god, this is really hard <laughs> on that yeah. other screen. I'm so glad I hit record. <laughs> we, we cut this out. Okay. I can't see where I'm going text, next. You're on text size. Oh, uh, text size. So just toggle top show. This is top part. Yeah. Okay. Is this working? Yeah, you use your mic. Oh, uh, your mic right phone. Hello, hello, hello. This worked before. Oh, for goodness sakes. I knew there would be a problem. All right, let's do this. It's back over here. Oh, there it is. It's, it was hidden by. Oh, yeah. okay. So we're working now. Yep. Woohoo! Good team. Woo Thank you. Um, all right. Cool. So everyone here is, hey, we gotta be more accessible. And then you pay companies or hire somebody to do big audits. And um, not always fun, not always budget friendly. So the idea is to build accessibility into your culture, into your work streams, into what you're doing already. Um, I usually, don't remember where I stuck it right now, I usually hold up my phone saying, you know, back when I was actually designing, the whole shifting a phone was a big usability problem we had to solve, but now it's part of our normal work streams. And the same idea goes now. So today, Today I need to get the mouse on the right thing. There we go. There we go. So today we're going to talk about where we are and where we're starting. Um, anybody who normally hears me talk knows that, yes, I talk about WCAG standards because they are the international standards, but they also talk about things like don't go by the checklist because you can check off every box and have an unusable experience. And that's really not what we're going for. So when we're gonna take a look at these tools today, I want you to make sure you're looking at it through the lens of the human experience and not only of what is compliant. Um, because really we're gonna talk about simulations, we're gonna talk about all these things that are going to make it a more effective part. But the, but the real key here is to don't get intimidated. Don't think you have to become some sort of grand expert. You just gotta do something. You know, just do something. Uh, my favorite line of one of my son's basketball coaches when all the kids were looking at him from the court, right? Yeah, just do something. Anything is better than not. So we're gonna look at some automated tools. But because automated tools only touch, I think they're up to 30 or 40%, they're getting better, of issues. And they can give us false positives. We're also gonna look at some manual tools. We're gonna look at some empathy building tools and statistics. Um, this is not the first time you're going to hear me have this disclaimer. Empathy tools are never going to give you a mile in someone's shoes. It is just going to help broaden your own perspective to understand that there are other ways of taking in the content. So there's that. And um, a little bit, oh, I don't know if I actually did the reading watch list. I think I ran out of time when I timed this, so I killed that. Um, but I can always provide that later. Find me on LinkedIn if you need to find stuff, or otherwise um, I can just chat with you because you know, we're all here in real life, which is so cool. So let's talk about the automated tools. No one wants to go line by line through code. We all know this, it's awful. So 30 to 40%, I already talked about that, but the point is they're really good. And, and some automated tests are really good because you don't necessarily get to take a deep dive every time you look at a page. Sometimes you just want to kind of put your toe in the water and decide, is this something I need to dive into to see if it's a bigger problem? So, site-wide testing. 
Axe Monitor. Um, some of these are going to be paid services. Some of these are free services. I'm just saying what's out there. This is not a Domus preference. This is not Indeed's preference by any means. These are just some of the tools out there that I'm familiar with that I know are effective. Um, Axe Monitor will take either lists of URLs or will crawl, like a search engine will crawl URLs and give you an idea of what the performance is. There's Pally, and these are all things that you can build into your systems. There's Pally, and this is open source, and they've got four different ones. Um, I've played with Pally and Pally Dashboard, being the less technical person, frankly. Um, but I know a few people who have used the Pally CI and really like it. Um, and these are things to basically all of these are, you know, if it catches the error, it throws it back to you and you can't push your code. Um, events is another paid one. They're, they take a look at, um, they have different scanners, they have different ways to upload CSV files or XML files or whatnot. Um, and they have everything from a browser extension that kind of looks at the front end, which we're going to talk about more in a few or they have some of these site scanners and debuggers that work a little bit more on the back side of things. So those are just a few of them, but the point of talking about those is that when you have a development process, if you're finding tools, and again, it doesn't have to be those, those are ones I'm aware of, these are not recommendations officially, but they're tools that can help build it into the, the part. You wanna have error checking, right? We, most of us have circle processes, yada yada, deployment processes, they have the automated checking. This is no different. This is just an additional rule set, which I know that some people are like, oh my gosh, this is gonna hold us up. But the fact is, it'll hold you, maybe it will hold you up at first. Maybe there's some non-best practices that are in your stream that you have to clear out. But I have to say, this is something that gets progressively easier because People are going to get sick of getting their tickets pushed back to them and not being able to deploy. So that, that is a fantastic way of looking at it and building accessibility into our culture itself. Now on the front end, Wave is a, a tool that, again, not indeed, Donna, um, really likes for a toe in the water. This is not what I'm going to do if I'm doing a heavy evaluation on some page. But this is if somebody comes to me, hey, what do you think of this? I usually show this first. Why? Because I can get a quick thing of, okay, what are, what are the issues? Are there errors coming up? Are there alerts coming up? And those alerts are very often things that need to be manually checked anyway. Um, sometimes those contrast errors just need to be manually checked. Um, maybe this, you know, there's an image somewhere in there and it's not a genuine contrast error. Um, it tells you, you know, is there a lot of ARIA going on? Because if there is, ARIA is really, I'm doing it again where I'm setting the darn touch screen up. Um, ARIA is something that's easy to mess up and when it's bad, it's really bad. Now if you want an understanding of why ARIA can, can go to the dark side, think of it this way. Picture yourself navigating your house in the dark, right? And you're feeling around. If you feel the edge of the couch, and then you bang your foot on more couch after trying to go around it, that's going to be a more frustrating experience than not feeling it and having to just kind of do the little dance forward trying to figure out how to get to the bathroom in the middle of the night in the hotel room you don't know what to do with, right? I'm not saying it happened last night. I'm just saying it does happen, okay? <laughs> So giving unclear or bad directions with ARIA is worse than not having them there. So when you see a large number of them, it doesn't mean it's bad. On a complicated website, you might need 96, you might need more, you might need 200, who knows? I don't know your web experience. But I'm saying that when you have a really high number, you might wanna just take a quick peek at this. So I love this tool as just that that reference of where am I starting from? How deep of a dive do I want to take? In a site like this, results like that, I don't want to take a deep dive. But 
if I were to see things that make me wonder, that make me really curious, I might start looking. Um, the Q's Acts is the one I would use for a deeper dive. Um, you, part of the page is, I think, page service, but the full page is fantastic. And at the end of this, if you want a demo, we can take a look at it. Um, it'll scan the whole page, and what I love about it is it tells you what the issue is. You can, a little accordion, open it up, check out where it is and co what code is doing it. It has links to their um, educational things. So you can find out, is this compliance? Is this best practice? So that way when you're making tickets, you can triage them appropriately, maybe give them the right story points or the right sprint to put them in based on the severity and the number of people who will be impacted. It gives you a lot of information. So this is what I want to look at if I am looking at, okay, there is something that very front-endy that I want to check out. You know, this is great when I'm looking at content. Do I want to know if your headers are in the right order? Because these big tags show up for headers too. And we want to be able to do that. But if I want to actually see, is this thing even going to work from that front-end perspective, I usually personally, again, not indeed, Donna, use that. Our toolkit is a favorite of a friend of mine. Um, absolutely loves it. He loves that they're, you know, categorizes errors and alerts about what su success criteria exactly it goes to, the numbers, I like the fact that you can just determine that, you know what, I only care about errors today, I don't have time for this. You can check it off so it's only errors. Um, I have apps and not arc in a few places, forget the typo. Um, so you can really take a great look. So this arc is right up there with acts if you want to take a deeper dive from that browser level perspective. Now if you're looking at a page with, you know, a website with, you know, 200 pages, this will not be your best friend. But if you are looking at a page, website with 200 pages and you want to look at the home page, the contact form, maybe a checkout process form, and a, a blog just to get, you know, some spot checks. These are these are my go-to opportunities. Um, give me a second. I gotta take advantage. And forgive me for going fast. I want to get a little bit more into the simulations and fun stuff later. And these are things that I figure if I can introduce you to tools that you may or may not already know, we can always talk later if you want to. So manual tools, your biggest tool is going to be, well, you. Um, again, nothing replaces the human experience. Every human is different. There's a million vari variables that make us what we are. Um, so the manual testing is first, check out your page top to bottom. Um, if you're looking at just, you know, your source code on how a page is rendered, just, I'm not saying read line by line. Nobody, nobody's going to do that, but look, Take a general look. Is the way the content is presenting itself making sense? Is something, you know, did somebody absolute position something off or floated off some way that it's showing up in a different order and a comprehension level than say you meant? Um, you know, am I able to get all the information before I'm asked to take the next step? So this is really important with forms or with errors on forms. You know, if you have this and you're looking at that, you know, inspect element and you're checking out that code and you realize that you have all your error messaging at the bottom, well, you're being asked to resubmit and you're hitting submit a million times and never getting to that error message, which means somebody who is using an assistive technology and maybe a non-visual experience so they don't even know that that error message is there is never getting that far. They're just seeing that they're hitting that submit and nothing's happening. That's their experience. So look at it. Can you take all of the steps in the correct order just in that process, looking at the code? Because when assistive technology looks at it, they're machines. They're going to go from top to bottom of your code. Um, and then, will I have to navigate to the top to take next steps? Like, where do you go from here? I mean, it, it's always the user journey, right? Every user, you want to give them a next step. And 
you want to make them that hero of their own stories. Anyone who hears me talk hears me say that over and over again. You know, the hero of their own story might be buying a really cool pair of socks. It doesn't have to be a great story, but they have to be able to complete it. So what is that next step? Are they able to navigate somewhere? Because think about your checkout experience. Amazon says, great, do you want to continue shopping? All right, who are we kidding? Everywhere online says, hey, do you want to keep shopping? Do you want to buy more? Let's, let's browse. What are you interested in? And they give you some algorithmic explosion of here's all the socks you could get with cats on them or something. I don't know. But the point is, they always give you that next step. Does this, at the code, are you able to take next steps? Are you stuck at the bottom of the page where you can just look at the privacy policy until you're blue in the face or just exit and leave? So if something in this process does not make sense to you, it's likely not going to make sense to your non-visual user. I mean, when you're looking at it just from this perspective, you're stripping away all the cool, shiny stuff and you're looking at the actual journey. So do keyboard testing. The next is, okay, close the code. We're all tired of that. There's pretty colors. There's lots of brackets. Go team. But close that. Look at it from that user. Refresh your page and just tap. Your tab will go for links. Your tab will go through. Do you travel in a logical order through your page just using your keyboard? Because a lot of individuals are going to only use their keyboard, and it's not only for screen reader users. Um, back, quick note about the whole doing this top to bottom for screen reader users is because not all screen reader users are non-visual. This is especially important here because if you're tabbing in an order that does not make sense visually, well, or going through it visually, assistive technology users, lots of them are visual users. So if it doesn't make sense, the order you're tabbing in, it's not going to make sense to the person or they're going to get frustrated taking the roundabout user journey trying to get to parking lot J this morning. <laughs> no, that was yesterday. But um, look, can they navigate the whole menu? I, I'm gonna sneak peek, I'm going to say zoom in the next slide. But if somebody's zoomed up to 200%, lots of hamburger menus don't want to open at 200% on a desktop using a keyboard. They get mad at you. They don't work. Check this out. You know, can you access all the links and all the form fields? A big thing on a lot of forms I've seen is it brings you through the form fields and then that check to accept terms and conditions, you can never get to the checkbox because you always go to the link for terms and conditions and you can never check the Lumen box with mm -hmm. just your keyboard. That's awful. We gotta be, do better than that. You know, do you get stuck anywhere? Someone came up to me yesterday saying, yeah, once we took a look at our thing, uh, we had a pop-up and we realized our, our close button never got keyboard focus. So everybody using only their keyboard would continually get stuck there. And then how does it feel? Is this a good experience? Because if it's not gonna be a good experience for you, who's seen it a million times, somebody who's not comfortable with the content is going to have an even lesser experience. So see, told you to talk about Zoom. It's important to keep in mind that most of our sites will go to their mobile experience when we zoom into 200%. Now, this is great for individuals maybe with, um, for, with visual impairments, but this might be somebody with um, attention regulation disorders. That's ADHD, I don't call it a, dis, uh, a deficiency or whatever because frankly ADHD is an abundance of attention and not a deficit, which we'll talk about briefly later. Um, so it, it, it trims it down, it makes it easy. There's a lot of humans who are going to want their desktop experience really that large. So, does it work on a desktop zoomed in to a mobile experience? In most cases, it, it does. I, I won't lie, most of them it does, but every once in a while, there's going to be something a little funky. So test it out, again, work it with the keyboard, make sure it all makes sense. Color contrast, we've all heard a lot about color contrast. Um, just to put a little context on it, color contrast is very important for those who um, are colorblind, 
but it's also really, really important. I'm trying not to look at the camera because this is very <laughs> self-conscious right now. Um, it is very important for those who are dyslexic. That's about 20% of the population. It's been proven that the higher contrast actually makes the character recognition processing a little bit easier. Uh, color contrast is better for, I don't know, any of us on our phone in a glary place with fluorescent lights. It's important for everybody. So we have a few of them. Um, web aim contrast checker. I always like this when I'm talking to people because it really makes it clear and under here it says what the guideline is if we were to scroll down on this screenshot. It says what that guideline is. So if you are sending it to somebody who maybe is like, oh wait, what do I gotta get to? It's right there. And by the way, there's a million color contrast checkers. Figma has an accessibility annotation toolkit which will help our design teams. Um, have them take a look at this. Build it into your brand guidelines um, or your client's brand guidelines if you're working with somebody else like that. But help make it like really, really, again, shift left. Shift this stuff left as much as possible. I personally love eight shapes because you put all of your colors in one part of the grid and all of your colors on the rest. And you say, okay, this works up to the AAA, so this is definitely good for everybody. This is AA compatible, but only at 18 points or larger. That doesn't pass for anything, so do not do it. That's what that means. Do not, does not pass AA compliant up to AAA. It'll tell you if it's um, all these things. So you, you have brand guidelines that you have to follow. You put all of them in there, and then you can kind of circle, hey, these are the ones I can use for text. These are the ones I can use for headings and text. You know, things like that. Then there's readability. Um, this is not a compliance. This is not legally required, except at AAA levels. However, it is really, 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 really important Readability comes down to anyone with cognitive disabilities who are trying to interpret what you're saying and ensuring that they interpret your content correctly. It is important for anyone with English or whatever language you're programming in for, or presenting in. If that's not their first language, having a lower reading level is better. If there's anyone who's distracted, emotionally disabled, any, or situationally distracted or emotional, readability, our, our ability to take in content goes down. So what we want to do is the Hemingway app is one of my personal favorites because it breaks down exactly where it is, what is the problem. Um, I acknowledge that this is color coded so it is not for everybody. I am saying that personally for Donna this works. It uses the Fletch Kincaid readability scale. Um, generally we all want to aim for ninth grade. That said, you know, if you're publishing a series of white papers, chances are you're not going to get to the ninth grade reading level. It's just not the nature of the content. So when we say aim for nine, that's more for general content. And typically, um, I have a, a friend who works at the government level, and they say they even try to sometimes go to sixth grade for government or for public service, healthcare type sites. Um, and when I was working on a, a healthcare one years ago, I recommended that for them because they were they were emergency response. And I'm like, if someone's going to this website asking for help, they are not going to be in an emotional or physical state to figure out anything more than the big orange button at the bottom. So it, it's really important to think that through. So I love Hemingway app, way app personally. Readability test is also really good. You can either, this one's good for uh, an entire URL. And then there's screen reader testing. Um, anyone who's ever heard me talk is like, okay, I acknowledge Mac VoiceOver is not by any means one of the most popular screen readers out there. If you are getting heavy into accessibility, I do not recommend using it for your testing. It is not the one out there. Screen, Mac VoiceOver on Safari has some usage but it's still relatively low in terms of trying to get the most people who need it help. That said, at the beginning, know how I said everybody who should 
do something, just do something? Well, this is just doing something. And using your, most of us are on Macs. Don't worry for you PC users, I have an option for you that's free too. Um, Mac VoiceOver is on your Mac, and it has a little tutorial. So you just follow the tutorial and do yourself a favor, slow down the voice. Because otherwise it talks like this, and who wants to really hear that? Because it's really, really hard to understand. Because, oh my god, it's really, really fast, like it's 2x speed on an audiobook, and oh my gosh. No, we slow it down, make it easy for yourself. You're not in a race, you're not proving anything, you're just listening to it. Um, Another perk of stuff like this is sometimes you'll get content things that you did not see. If you are a visual user who is used to seeing things visually, we all kind of gaze over content for the 15,000th time we've looked at that same page. If you close your eyes and listen to it, you go, oh my gosh, wait, did I just put the same paragraph in there twice? You'll hear things you didn't catch. So if you, it's just an extra perk. I always call that. So you have a tutorial. If you have a Mac, this is installed. I recommend checking it out with Safari over Chrome as much as I love using Chrome for everything in the world. Safari with VoiceOver is a more common experience statistically of the number of people actually using it. Another one for Windows that's free is NVDA. Now NVDA has a whole lot more usage than um, VoiceOver. It's not the same level as JAWS. Um, there is a program, it's very, it's expensive. There is a screen reader out there. You can get licensed to JAWS, most common on PCs, go team. But again, if we're just doing something, NVDA does have a lot of users, and again, it is free. So they have ways of doing it. There are tutorials online. You know, here's, you know, they have great documentation. Do I want to just go through all the headers? I press A, Command H. You know, th there's options here. So, empathy building tools and statistics. Basically, if we do empathy at scale, we have a culture of accessibility. That's what we want. We want individuals to start considering this into their everyday practices. This isn't the QA stage. This is all of it. If 26% of the US identifies as disabled and a whole lot of people, frankly, were never identified because, you know, back in the 90s and 80s, guess what? They didn't really do as much. So there's a whole, whole piece of our population out there. So if one of the personas you're working with doesn't show or present as disabled, you're probably not really doing your personas. They're, they're out there. So. We want to start building some empathy here. So first way to do that is to find people who are willing to talk about it. Um, I'm gonna, uh, okay, lost my train of thought, it's back. So find people who are willing to talk about it. It is not anyone's responsibility to educate us on what their experience is. But luckily, there are whole international databases full of people, like on YouTube, um, of people who are talking about this. It's not just, you know, coming to a camp. There are thousands and thousands of resources. So, I might skip this video for, I think this is a fantastic video though. Say it's only two minutes, we'll play it. But this is one person just talking about their experience and understanding how people think and the people who are willing to share it is vital. It is the most powerful tool you can have. The most accurate label for the oh. highest line is ASHG, or Attention Surplus High Energy Gift. So the attention part is obvious and the most misunderstood, as there is absolutely no deficit. Instead, we are inundated with a surplus of information daily and with a significantly diminished ability to filter through any of it. This has us living in a constant state of overstimulation and thought chaos. Also, at 54, I'm quite certain that I'd rather be described as high energy than hyperactive. And <laughs> disorder is a shame word, so I think we'll do the whole world a favor and hit the delete button on that. Instead, we'll go with gift, as here's the thing. Those of us with something extra to deal with every day, 
typically shine in a way that's different from the neurotypical population. For ADHDers, this is our enhanced ability for divergent thinking, meaning that we are capable of insane creativity and innovation. Here's why. Our minds are lightning fast and wired to wander, so we don't get stuck in the shoulds and ought tos of how things look like or function. This is why many of us become writers, filmmakers, inventors, and entrepreneurs. Uh, I just didn't want to let the keep going because I don't know if, a, if it stopped where it's supposed to. So that is just one of thousands of examples of people who are expressing it. And the reason I did want to show that is because what we just watched had nothing to do with WCAG standards, but everything to do with the usability of your site in testing your site. So if you're thinking of yourself of looking at it, do you have a ton of just animations because you can on your site? Is everything moving? Do you have three videos back to back? How is someone going to actually be able to maneuver that site in a way that's comfortable, in a way that they can take in that content? That is a check. Learning to understand how other people look at it is a check. Statistics are huge. Anyone who knows and knows. I love looking at research of what is out there. Now, I'm the first to acknowledge, and I, especially with the bottom of the room, I have to say it, um, statistics can be biased based on both who is collecting them, how they're collecting them, and how they are collecting them. They also can be biased by how we decide to talk about them. So, with that though, they do make really, really good arguments if you have somebody who's pushing back you know what, that's really not important to us right now. Well, 20% uh, of the population or more is neurodivergent, so guess what? It's really, really important to you that this thing doesn't have 16 animations of people spinning in various directions. Between the neurodivergent quantity, the people with vestibular, those are people who get motion sick really easy basically, or balance issues. Between the vestibular issues and the, the attention deficit, you're going to lose 20% or more of your audience, and the rest of us are just going to be annoyed. So understanding this and using these statistics can back you up. It does not change the human focus, but it backs you up and it validates you when you need someone else to do that. So empathy builders. Um, we've got Todali. Funkify and Silk Tide are three of the ones that I look at. Um, and these are just different tools to show us, and there's a little whole thing where I'm gonna use some of these in a minute. Um, to, again, not to walk a mile in someone's shoes, but instead to help us break out of our own way of thinking. Um, all of our brains are awesome. All of our brains are, are different but we also get stuck in our own patterns. We're stuck in our, we get used to seeing it, especially when you're working remotely. At some point, I am really just looking at the world as Donna with a small dog on her lap at her computer and holding onto her coffee like it is the only thing <laughs> anchoring her to the planet. We're gonna get stuck in our own heads a little bit. So let's do a few simulations. Okay, check that out. I even found the first of these here. So we're gonna pick on Twitter today because I'm mad. No, um, no, I'm not. No, it's mad. But we're all, you know, I, I just figured it was one that everyone's talking about at this camp. So I figured I'd do that. Um, so we'll use Funkify for this one. So this is just a 20% blur. Um, so if you take a look at these things, look at what's easier for you to make out and what's challenging. You know, the bold text that's by itself is pretty easy, but Illinois' bolded blurred out is a little bit more challenging. Um, you know, it's actually not awful at this blur rate, so go team, but um, that, that could happen. So. What does this mean for maybe what you're doing in your work? Well, that means that, are you looking at it? These are all normal or bold weight fonts. Do you have light fonts? Light fonts blur out like nothing. 
if, you know, if trending being gray and bold at that size is hard. Imagine if that was lightweight at that size. A lightweight font would blur all the way out. So think of it that way. Um, these are the things that the simulators can do is to help look for some of the, those challenges. Um, a dyslexic, does this one have dyslexic? Does this one stop? Oh, and by the way, this will stay on on this tab forever. And the time I forgot that I had this particular one on it, and I came back after my lunch and found that my, my screen is moving, there was a moment of, what did I do? So I do want to say, and again, many of you have heard me say this before, dyslexia is actually not a visual challenge. It is a cognitive disability. It is character recognition. Um, the book of Difference talked about somebody saying that they think people perceive moving or backwards characters because it's the recognition takes so long that by the time the information goes from the eyes to the back of the head where they're trying to work on it and back to the front, people don't necessarily remember what order it came in. So the brain is trying to put those characters it had a hard time recognizing in the right order in the right direction. I don't know, not a doctor, but that's some of the research. It's character recognition. It's not actually moving or backwards characters. However, things like this make it real easy to see, okay, you know, this casing helps. Having the capital letters helps. Um, this particular site doesn't have all caps. If you were to look at something with all caps, you'd realize it's much harder to tell where those letters go if they're all capitals. What is Taking in the readability of that content is much, much more difficult. Oh. This is the one that always gets me. This is why form buttons should be farther apart, especially if it's a reset button or clear cart. Let's, let's make sure we always have the double check because hand tremors are super, super common. There's a million things that can cause them. Um, anything from a situation where maybe you woke up feeling sick to uh, age, sorry, uh, anyone else has heard this before too, but if we are lucky enough to live long enough, we are going to age ourselves into disability. If you're not already joining me there, seriously, it's going to happen. Age is one of the common reasons for this. But there can be medications. There can be medical reasons. Hand tremors are super, super common. So keep that in mind um, when designing for it. And this one I really kind of shut off because that one, that's another one that came back from lunch one time. <laughs> um, colorblind dysmorphia. I actually like this other tool better for colorblind dysmorphia. Okay, so the tool's not liking me today. Fine, we'll get back over here. Nope, they don't have that one anymore. Alright, um we'll do this one then. Red green is the most common color type of color blindness out there. It um 8% of males of European, Northern European descent will automatically be, well not automatically, are um, colorblind. Um, it's a much higher percentage in male, uh, sorry, those born biologically male than those born biologically female. Um, it's some areas of the world, there's you know concentrated uh, groups of people who perceive it this way, but this is the most common. Um, if Colors are too close to each other. They will blend together. I don't have the ability on this, but you know, someone this color blind does have blurred vision, so think of it that way too. There's a lot of a lot of comorbidity and and opportunities here to perceive things very very differently. So 
So um, a couple of other tools that are for color blind simulation specifically are color blinding and color blindly. So read and watch. Oh, good. Did I really? This is embarrassing. I don't remember doing these slides. <laughs> oh, go! Look at me. I was all over it. All right. I'm a big fan of what Microsoft has been doing with their accessibility work. Um, their blogs are great. They've got great tools um, here in their insights to help people really start understanding it. Um, they've done some cool stuff there. So their accessibility insights are awesome. Okay, and, and by the way, in my defense about not remembering these slides, I always have my decks done a month ahead of time. So by, by the time I get here, I, I don't always remember to check the back. Um, so there we go. DQ has a, a million fantastic resources. Um, there are university materials that you access through Axe, the, the browser extension. It's fantastic. Um, they have a four-part series on assessment to um, hands-on tutorials. Absolutely a dip, deeper dive. Of course, I'm going to plug Alley Talks. <laughs> um, but we do monthly uh, monthly sessions, variety of topics. We have a couple of the speakers in this room, so I know that a few of you are at least familiar with it. Um, variety of accessibility topics, awesome people, uh, really, really focused on trying to get underrepresented voices heard as well. And woohoo, we did it with time for Q&A or if there's anything you want to see or hear demoed. Are you gonna have your slides online? Yes. Oh, great. I just have them. What's that? How common is like other color blindness, like other, other than red green? It, it, it's common, um, just not as common. I mean, in general, that 8% of men from Northern European descent is just generalized, but there are, it, in those born men, it can be up to the eight or 10% mark. Um, again, in general, I don't know the percentage of red green versus the others. Um, in those born biologically women, it tends to be around 2%, maybe. Um, but I don't know the breakdown of the others. Sorry. Anybody else have thoughts? Um, for the ADHD, um, you know, issues that present with websites, how do you, I know there isn't a tool to help with that kind of thing, so how would you assess a website with um, being able to be processed by somebody who has ADHD. Cool, um, I should have been doing this first. I'm just gonna report it. Report. I just caught it there, but just in case, mm -hmm. let me repeat it for the recording. Um, how to check a site for, for those or ADHD usability. And with anything like that, it's a matter of keeping it simple. And that's not only gonna help somebody with ADHD. Um, somebody on the spectrum is uh, in a constant state of translating the world around them into their own thought processes because our world is not necessarily built for every brain, let's put it that way. So what we want to do is like in any of those cases where we're looking at the neurodivergent piece and not sure how it's going to be impacting, we want to have very clear lines of, uh, of clear user journeys. We want to have some, not childish, but simple, in, uh, uh, concise, navigation. You don't want to overwhelm somebody with a million options. Those drop down menus that are, you know, you open a thing and it's four columns wide and ten in each one. It's like, you know, why bother with a menu at that point? Um, keep it clear, very concise, very, very dr journey driven. Um, and think about the distractions. I'm not saying animations are bad and I'm not saying videos, multiple videos are bad. I'm saying do things with intent. Never have anything autoplay. Always be allowed to stop the motion. Always be able to simplify the experience. Um, and then there are things out there that individuals may be using. And if you're if you're concerned about it, you can test your site with a, a plugin called Mercury Reader, and that is designed specifically for people. And it washes out everything other than what it thinks is the content on the page. 
the menu goes away, the ads go away, the sidebar goes away. It is just the content to help somebody focus. Um, if you're thinking about um, some people with ADHD find reading challenging. Um, so they'll use a lot of the same tools somebody who maybe um, identifies as dyslexic would use. So there are certain plugins that will highlight words as they are at, at, a, at a rate, either at a specific rate or as it's being read aloud. There are, other than there are screen readers designed for visual users too. And the, so they'll read it aloud and they'll highlight each word as they go. And that, um, that is something some individuals use to help them focus in on this is what, this is what I'm reading. And it, it, it's just, it gives a little bit more of a guide. Um, and again, I think screen reader compatibility is really important for that. And again, it's not only the non-visual experience. Making sure that visual experience matches the screen reader experience is really important. Because if somebody is ADHD and finds reading super challenging, they might just want to listen to it. So making sure that they can listen to it, but it makes sense visually while they're listening to it. Does that help? Very much, thank you. Cool. It's it. Um, do you have any tips or advice on getting um, real users to test your stuff? Um, there are also integrating that into your process, shifting yeah. left. Thanks. Whatever yeah. shifting left means, I don't know if you said what it means. Oh, oh, I'm getting first, first question. <laughs> All right, shifting left means. I'm laughing. I just spilled water down my chin. Excuse me. All right. Um, thank you, April. All right. So first question is how to get native user testing. A native user is someone who uses assistive technologies all the time. Um, yes. You. You. We're doing quick tests so that you can feel empowered to do something. But when you are doing user testing in general, organizations such as Fable are, and there's others out there too, actually have people who are disabled who are willing to test your work for money. This is what it comes down to. And yes, this is something you should budget for. No, this is not cheap. Um, and nor should it be. People are giving you their time and reporting what their findings are. Um, so there are absolutely ways to do that. Um, how much user testing you do is going to determine, be determined by your budget, your timeline, and what key factors you want to test. Um, typically you don't say, hey, go to town on my 400 page website with 77 PDFs per page. Probably not your best choice, probably not budget friendly. But if you have specific user journeys, hi, go buy a pair of socks with cats on it. I do not know why, I don't even own cat socks. Oh, no, actually I do. Yeah, you do. I do, three <laughs> pairs. I'm getting called out on everything, it's just me. No, um, just kidding, honey. All right, so I, I do own cat socks. So maybe your goal is to own, have cat socks. You give that team the specific journey of this is what you need to accomplish. And that will guide them through that and they'll be able to test that better. And the other thing is shifting left, yes. Um, forgive me for not explaining that. Uh, if you're not familiar with sprint boards, typically you have, or, or project management, typically you have your process is, you know, ideation, discovery, uh, ideation, hey, we have this cool idea. Discovery, is it gonna work? Um, design, how can we make it look cool? Development, let's make this actually function now. Uh, QA, does it really work and what is broken? And then deployment, I just walked from left to right. We keep putting accessibility in this QA spot. If we put it back here with ideation and discovery, way over to the left, what we're seeing is that we're thinking about the personas being disabled. We are thinking about, is our idea inclusive? Are we talking about hiring models? Are we hiring disabled talent? Are we hiring disabled team members? Are we doing this? This is what happens over here, way in the left. And when you get 
disabled voices into your conversation, and when you get disabled talent into your process, suddenly everything else is a lot more accessible. So when you get back over here to QA, you're not redoing your work, which saves everybody time, money, headaches, and you owing somebody a beverage of some sort. <laughs> or sucks. Um, so with that, it's really important to have that representation throughout the process. It's basically what these, both these questions reference. Is that having disabled voices be a part of the conversation is vital. Uh, real quick, uh, example. Um, I know somebody who works with disabled talent. That person noticed a problem in an ad. They are a mobility, um, they have a mobility tool, they have a wheelchair, and they looked at that ad and said, that's bold. That's not how somebody really uses it. That's just sitting in a wheelchair. That's not how you work or sit. There is a leaning thing going on. That's not how this works. If you have disabled talent, they know and they can make it more authentic. Because authenticity is what we need to get across. We're trying to create authentic user experiences. And that's why it's important to have those voices in the room. So, definitely do these quick tests. Do these things, get your feet in, start learning, start building the into your culture. But yes, always, avoid, oh, always involve those voices. Um, if you have any other questions, I know we're just about at time. Oh, we get to go to lunch, don't we? Oh, I love food. I wish I had stopped recording already. Um, <laughs>